Welcome again to the Anglican Diocese of Melbourne uh, weekly service. Uh, I'm Bishop Paul Barker and we're at St. David's Moorabbin and leading the service today is the Reverend Michelle Wang who's the curate at St. Andrew's Brighton. Uh, you are very welcome to participate in this service as much as you feel able to do so. Uh, let God speak to you and encourage you and be with you uh, during this time today. We're going to sing our opening song, A New Commandment I Give Unto You. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, Jesus said. This is the great and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. O oh God, whose Son has shown the way of the cross to be the way of life, transform and renew our minds that we may not be conformed to this world, but may offer ourselves wholly to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The 
first reading for this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading for this morning is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil 
with good. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Hear the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray. Lord our God, speak to us from your word. Write it in our hearts that in believing it, we may obey it and live for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Drive around Melbourne and you'll see so many different types of churches. Anglican, Catholic, Methodist, Salvation Army, Lutheran, and on it goes. Why so many churches? Why is there not one organization? Of course, in some parts of the world, the variety of churches has actually spilled into great hostility. Think of places like Northern Ireland or even in Jerusalem with the fights that uh, happen between different denominational churches. Since the church began, disunity has plagued it. It's an issue in, in most of the letters of the New Testament. We see little glimpses of it in the Acts of the Apostles even. And it was certainly a significant reason why Paul wrote the letter to the Romans from which our epistle reading came today. Here was a church in Rome that Paul had not yet visited, which was under at least pressures of fracture because of distinctions between Jew and Gentile, that is non-Jewish Christian people. But Romans tells us in this passage today that yes, unity should be pursued and practiced, but it is not unity at any cost. It's unity that comes out of the gospel of Jesus for 11 chapters, Paul has expounded this great and glorious gospel of Jesus. And throughout that exposition, he's been clear to show that the gospel is equally for Jew and for Gentile. So it's Jew and Gentile equally who've fallen short of the glory of God in the opening chapters. It's Jew and Gentile equally who stand under the threatened judgment of God because of their sins. It's Jew and Gentile who equally can be saved by the death of Jesus, forgiven for their sins by him. And in the end, there is no distinction in Christ for Jew or Gentile. 
that theme is quite significant through the letter, not least in chapters 9 to 11, preceding today's reading as well. But the gospel of Jesus is not just about getting saved and forgiven or justified in the eyes of God. It is about, as Paul said in the opening paragraph of the whole letter, the obedience of faith, saved by faith, forgiven through faith, but now to practice the obedience of faith. And a common theme of that obedience, and it dominates today's passage in chapter 12, which is the application of the whole letter, is harmony and unity between the people of God. Of course, our world does not live often in unity and harmony. You think how many countries in our world are facing civil disputes, anger, protests, divisions, racial divisions, political divisions, hostile enemies from other countries coming in. That's been typical all through human history, pre-Jesus and post-Jesus. But the church is to be different from that. Because we're transformed by the gospel of Jesus and no longer conformed to the likeness of this world, that's how chapter 12 began, we prayed that in the collect prayer earlier in the service, that is because of the gospel of Jesus and the transformation that that gospel brings, we're not to be like our world. Unity and harmony are to mark Christian people above all. And so this passage of application an application that is not just rules and regulations, but comes out of the gospel of Jesus, says, let love be genuine. Not fake love, not a superficial love, not a, a love that is a pretense or hypocrisy, a, an acting or a charade, but a love that is committed, real, enduring, genuine, deep love, and not merely marriage love or family love, a, a deep love in particular for God's people. Such a love is a robust love. It's not just a sentimental or soppy or romantic feeling, but it's a love that, Paul goes on to say, hates what is evil. If you love somebody else, you will love what is good and hate what is evil. It holds fast to what is good. Notice the strength of those verbs. Hates evil, doesn't flirt with it or is indifferent to it, and holds fast to what is good, not sits lightly with it, but holds fast to it almost like a dog with a bone. Our world tolerates evil and is often indifferent to what is good. But we're to hate evil and hold fast to that which is good. Let love, uh, rather, love one another with mutual affection. Here in particular, thinking within the fellowship or the community of Christian people, it's a, a family affection word implied here because Christians are adopted by God into the same family as God's children. And earlier in the letter, chapter 8, we can call God our Heavenly Father by the spirit that's common within us. We belong together and therefore there should be this mutual affection one for the other. Then Paul says, outdo one another, almost like a competition, outdo one another in showing honour. Well, our world loves to claim and grasp honour. Think of all the honours, the awards, the halls of fame and so on that mark our world these days. Think of how many people love the attention, love to be in power, love to be acknowledged. But Christians are to outdo one another, not in claiming honour, but in showing honour, giving honour, esteeming others, lifting others up, praising others, honouring other people. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Again, this runs counter to our world. When the Methodist Church began and ultimately broke away from the Church of England under the Wesleys, people often hated the zeal of Methodism. And so too today. Our world can tolerate a sort of private or, or respectable religion, but actually turns its nose up at and dislikes zeal in faith. But we are not to lag in zeal. We're to be ardent, in fact, in our spirit, serving the Lord. It's not that we're to be zealous people 
as a general caricature of our life, zealous for whatever comes along, but rather zealous for serving the Lord himself. For God's poured his spirit into our hearts, as chapter 8 says, setting us a glow or a fire to serve the Lord zealously, eagerly, fervently. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Well, our world doesn't rejoice in hope. It's nervous in its hope. But we're to rejoice in our hope because hope does not disappoint us, as chapter 5 said. We're to be patient in suffering. Our world hates suffering, hates pain. But we're to be patient in suffering because all things will ultimately work together for good for those who love the Lord, as chapter 8 said. We're to persevere in prayer, even when it seems our prayers are not being answered. We're to persevere in prayer because God's Spirit has been poured into our hearts, a spirit of adoption whereby we call God our Father, and a spirit who intercedes for us, groaning for us even. So persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Generosity and hospitality to be marks of Christian godly character. Again, very different from our world that is often so lacking in generosity, so greedy for its own comfort, uh, turning its backs on those who are in need and sh sh against showing hospitality to, for example, refugees. In the ancient world, there were no hotels virtually, and so travellers would be put up in a spare room of maybe strangers' houses. Christians were to show generous hospitality even to strangers, different from our world. And perhaps even more nonconformist, verse 14 says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. See, our world wants to get back, our world wants vengeance. Our world wants to revenge against those who hate them. So often is the case. But we are to bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse. Echoing words of Jesus, and we see examples of Paul doing this himself in the Acts of the Apostles as well. So different from our world that does not like nonconformity. And then another expression of genuine love in verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. The latter of the two is perhaps easier, to mourn with those who mourn. But so often when our friends, our colleagues, others are rejoicing because of some great uh, achievement, accomplishment or something, there's an element of bitterness with us, within us because it's them and not us. Our own ego and pride is assaulted sometimes. Rejoice with those who rejoice. That's showing sincere and genuine love for others. Verse 15 is about love that is not a spectator, but a love that is embraced within other people, empathizing and sympathizing and rejoicing with them not merely watching on from a safe social distance. And then perhaps summing it all up so far in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. That, I think, is the fundamental reason why Paul wrote this whole letter to the Romans, so that transformed by the gospel of Jesus, Jew and Gentile without distinction, male and female, old and young, racial distinctions all gone, all brought together, all one in Christ, live in harmony with one another. The causes of harmony he touches on again in the next part of the verse, 16. Don't be proud. Pride destroys harmony, time and again. But be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited, proud or arrogant or boastful. And again, it's the gospel of Jesus that helps us change from pride to humility and therefore love because the gospel is not something that we can boast in my acceptance by god is not my achievement it's not my boast the gospel actually does not flatter us it pulls the carpet from under our feet because we need to depend entirely on god's grace 
and not on our own virtue or accomplishment. The gospel of God gives us no grounds for personal pride. And so therefore, as a fruit of the gospel, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. The letter to the Romans was probably written around 55 AD, early in the reign of Nero, that despotic emperor of the Roman Empire. And possibly Paul could foresee already the heightening persecution against the early Christian church. Christians were fed to lions, crucified, executed, blamed by Nero and others later on. How should Christians react in such a a political environment? Not as the world acts, not seeking retribution or vengeance. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, he says. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of people. And if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Paul, I think, is reflecting the increasing tensions of his own world. To live at peace, to live in harmony, even within society, not seeking vengeance or retribution when somebody acts against you, to turn the other cheek in effect. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. That is, God's the ultimate judge. Let God be judge. We may want justice now, immediately. We're impatient often for justice and vindication and acquittal. But leave it with God, the ultimate judge, who judges perfectly and fairly in his own time, one day. And therefore, because we leave things to God, the judge, We can turn the other cheek, we can love our enemies, we can bless those who persecute us, we can refrain from seeking retaliation or revenge. For God says, it's mine to avenge and I will repay. But on the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. That is, you show their wickedness and evil by loving them even more in generous hospitality. So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This passage in a way brings us full circle through the letter to the Romans, because in the opening chapter of Romans, as Paul describes the caricature of his society in a way and its its values, He spoke about those who claim to be wise becoming fools. But in this passage, he says, do not claim to be wiser than others. In chapter one, he spoke of those people typifying our societies who are filled with strife and malice. He says, live peaceably with all. His society is typified by haughtiness, pride, arrogance in chapter one. Here, don't be haughty or proud in verse 16. People invent what is evil and love what is evil. They approve evildoers in chapter 1. But here, hate what is evil. They hate God in chapter 1. Here, serve the Lord with zeal. They're heartless in chapter 1. Here, rejoice and weep. You see, such harmony, such movement from our world and conformity to the world to being transformed is through the gospel of Jesus Christ, a powerful gospel of grace of faith in Jesus' totally sufficient death and resurrection and transformed by the spirit of the same Jesus poured into our hearts. We're to be non-conformists in this world because of the gospel of Jesus. So let this demanding passage be like a checklist for you. To what extent is the gospel of Jesus transforming you to be a non-conformist in our world for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of serving the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, may the power of the Spirit of Jesus transform us more and more into his likeness, that we may be nonconformists in our world, but living the life of Jesus. Amen.
Let us together affirm the faith of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that he is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary, and became hope truly human. For our sake he was crucified on Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We ask you in your mercy to receive our prayers which we offer to your divine, divine majesty. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially our Prime Minister, Cabinet Ministers, and every elected member of the Parliament who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We beseech you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers that by their life and doctrine they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace and especially to this congregation here present that they may receive your word with meek hearts and due reverence and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples that with them we may be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear us, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcome sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful for God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use your offering for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honor be yours always and everywhere. Mighty creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Mercy of God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
after supper, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood shed for you and for many. This is my blood of a new covenant shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, we do as our Savior has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup, his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. We are confident to pray. 愿你的国降临to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body. the gift of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and the blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
living God in this holy meal, you fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in word and sacrament, continue your saving work among us, give us courage for our pilgrimage, and bring us to the joys of the promise. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. The second hymn is Take Up Your Cross. Peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.